Hello and welcome everyone to the Movement Made Better podcast. We're very excited to have with us Monica Bolt. So Monica, we'll turn it over to you to do a little intro, please. Okay. Thanks, guys. I'm glad to be here. So a little bit about me. I've been a personal trainer for probably about 12 years now. My background, actually, I was kind of a sickly child (laughs) and as a figure skater for a long time, but I knew very, very young that I wanted to go into the fitness profession. And so I did. So I... Uh, Strong First certified. I'm stick mobility certified. I do a lot with uh, Indian clubs and really interested in actually the the whole aspect of the person. So if I have a client come in, I'm wanting them to have quality movement. I'm wanting to look at you know just how well they move and what's going on, and working on their mobility and then strengthening them after we've worked on those issues. And so I like to have different tools in my toolbox because not every client is going to work well with some things or you just need something different and it clicks in how they learn and how they process information. So I'm always learning, trying to find new things and new ways to communicate to my clients. And of course, just with my own training, keep myself mobile and you know go after anti, if for, go for longevity as, as much as possible. Congratulations on your strong first elite. So you Thanks. just completed yeah. that. We saw yeah. that. That was fantastic. That was <laughs> so that's yeah. uh, physically extremely demanding, huh? Well, programming for that because I had to program for several things that I was training for during that time. So you have to know your body super, super well about about how much volume you can handle, and then also trying to progress to certain standards. So that was a fun challenge. And I started that about June. So June till December, that was just my primary focus. So they still have the beast tamer challenge, right? And the iron maiden for they do. So Mm. I, I will probably eventually go for iron maiden. So this year I have several, several things I'm trying goals. I'm trying to hit with barbell. So for the Iron Maiden, you have to do a strict military press with the 24 kg, a pistol squat with the 24 and a pull up with the 24. So I already have the military press. So for me, it's starting now to add more weight on my pull ups and add more weight on my pistol squat. So on the pistol, your, your goblet holding that goblet position. Yes, you're goblet okay. holding it. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I think I've seen you bent press some serious weight. Yeah. So yeah, well, the bim press is another whole thing. I absolutely love that, and I'm kind of limited to, <laughs> to the kettlebells I have and what what I have. So I've had to actually double bells right now. I've hit a 36 kg bim press nice. just by doubling up bells. So that yeah. makes it more challenging because it, <laughs> my hands like this. <laughs> yeah, right. You got that then, big. Yeah, getting that load on your bell, making your hand and making sure it's just right. So I've been trying to practice now with dumbbells and if I can hit like a 40 kg with a dumbbell, which is actually a little more nerve wracking because when I'm practicing with bells, even though there's a lot of tension on your forearm, you still have, it gives you that stability. And so mm-hmm. with the dumbbell, that's taken away. So it's, yeah. it's all. <laughs> so you know, yeah, I, I found that with, when you're doing a bent press with a barbell or a dumbbell, it requires a little extra shoulder mobility too. Cause the, you know, when the kettlebell is back here, it almost yeah. shifts your arm forward slightly. Yes, it does. Yeah. You got to have good thoracic rotation um, and just getting everything really, really lined up well. So yeah. What are some common mistakes that people make in a, when they're trying to do a bent press? I'm working on somebody right now, coaching someone. It's funny because he felt pain when he did the bent press and he knew he wasn't doing it right. And we cleaned it up and like, and this was all over Instagram message. Him sending me a video of me sending something back and he cleaned it up within like 30 minutes Oh, and he didn't feel any pain, which is awesome. So yeah, (laughs) shouldn't. I would say the most common things is that first of all, they're not getting good enough thoracic rotation. So really work on that first. And then they're pressing it actually instead of getting the body under the bell. So yeah. there's no, everyone's bent press is going to look unique. I would say uh, most people, though, either way uh, you do it, most people tend to not center their weight into their hips and align themselves. So they'll tend to just kind of fold at their torso and drop 
and then they'll, or they'll just try to press it up. And it's not, you have to, it's basically stays motionless and then the body comes underneath. So that's probably the most common that I see. Have you figured out any ways to, you know, kind of not hack, but, um, but help fix the bench press using combining the sticks and the kettlebells? Yes. So that's how I got my PR with the 36 was I I primed with stick mobility first. Okay. Okay. And there's, and I have that post on my Instagram. So basically I get the stick behind me and I go into, I get into my kind of squared off slightly separated stance for the bent press. And then I do some thoracic rotation, but I also bring, instead of having my arms just out, I bring it down where I'm pulling my tricep into my lat. And so there I can use the radiation and I can use push and pull with the stick, create all that tension. And then I immediately went over to my lift and I got it. So (laughs) that's happened multiple, multiple times. Like if if I feel like I'm stuck with something, immediately go to the stick, prime it, get all that max tension. And then boom, you know, I've got it. Oh, cool. so are you driving the stick into the ground or are you, are you pulling with the opposite hand? With that one? I think I probably, I probably played with both, but I would say probably the compression because mm-hmm. ultimately this hand I'm driving into my thigh. Yes. Right. Yeah. So if you pull that, you know, or push that way together and that create that compression, then that's just going to lock everything up and to make you a little power ball. <laughs> awesome. You do Indian clubs and we definitely wanted to delve into it because Indian clubs just aren't very, well, they're not, you don't see them everywhere, but what are some of the things that you love about using Indian clubs? So it started for me about three and a half years ago. And I came from a music background as well. Mm -hmm. So I'm a classical singer and how I learn things like visual, but just also how things feel like internally, Mm -hmm. that's a big driver. So when I started learning clubs, uh, I was like, wow, okay, this is fun. Thankfully, I've never dealt with any serious injuries. So I've never had to deal with that. Now I'm hypermobile though. And I'm always looking for ways to keep my soft tissues resilient, to strengthen up weak points, you know, to help with all that stuff, which will cross over into my other lifting. So when I started swinging, I just realized for me, kind of the main thing was actually the brain benefits. So it was one thing that I missed when I kind of had to move away from my my full-time performing as singing, which I did back in college and stuff, (laughs) was the intense focus of thinking about a million different things <laughs> and being able to do that. And so when, as I got older and I actually also got into the dental profession, so I do like dental sales mm-hmm. and the constant jumping from one thing to another and never being able to like focus actually created problems with my short-term memory for a while. I had oh really good photographic memory in college and I could remember anything great, but the nature of the job made my shirt term memory just go kaput. And so when I picked up clubs, one of the immediate benefits I noticed was my short term memory came back. Like I could remember things and that had to do with thinking about complex patterns. And then especially when I got into, okay, my right, my right hand is doing something different than my left hand. Mm -hmm. And then going back and forth in my mind's eye, thinking about that, Mm -hmm. (laughs) like five or 10 minutes of just that complete focus helped me remember things and it just, it changed my world. So that was the main benefit immediately. And then starting to swing like heavier clubs for longer duration, just noticing how that affected my finger strength, (laughs) Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. (laughs) my grip, my forearms. And then of course the creative aspects. So coming up with that also, it was like an outlet for my performance side. So you can, you can do the basics and stick with that, but you can also get creative. And that's kind of the outlet for my brain with that. So. Cause I really, the first time we, well, the first time we experienced in Indian clubs. Yeah. You're like, well, I'm, I'm strong, but I'm a moron when it comes to just <laughs> this stuff. You're just all like all over the place. And then you see someone like Dr. Ed Thomas, he's up on stage and he's just all making it look like he's breathing air and you're just all like, how the hell is he doing that? So yeah, <laughs> it's a definite brain teaser. It is. And you have to kind of slow down. Um, I think 
just like how kettlebells expose weakness or certain things in the body, I feel like clubs do the same. So they, mm-hmm. they can bring out, wow, I'm really ungraceful in this movement or <laughs> <laughs> man, my left side picks things up way quicker than my right side. Or I thought I was this kind of learner, but I guess not, you know? Mm -hmm. So it's one of those things where I I say it's a gift that keeps giving because it doesn't matter how long you you're swinging clubs, you're going to always find something new that you benefit from and you'll see how it starts impacting your life. Like it just never stops (laughs) the lessons it teaches you. And I think that then you can combine it with music. So that's kind of another thing that is really mm-hmm. big with me is, and it has history to that too. So there, there's kind of, there is background with that, but club swinging helps you. I should say when we're lifting or we're doing other things, a lot of times we just throw things around. We're not even really thinking about that yeah. internal beat mm-hmm. in our body. Mm-hmm. And especially for men, I don't want to get into like sexism here, but no, like, it's very true. Yeah. It's very true. There is yeah. a difference between, I think, female swingers that I see and men. And I think it's a really good thing for men to swing because it gets them to stop and realize this is not, you know, iron where I'm throwing around. It's something that requires some finesse. It requires thinking about the smaller muscles and, you know, what am I actually doing here with the range of motion in my shoulder joint, and elbow, and wrist and stuff. So with music, you start feeling because club swinging follows inertia and gravity principles. And when someone taps into that, they start feeling kind of like that heartbeat rhythm Mm -hmm. to the swing. It has this inner pulse. And then that's when aesthetically it looks good, but it also steadies you and your your swinging becomes very connected and you, Mm -hmm. you know, brings everything together. So when I'm teaching people club swing, that's one of the first things I, I teach them because it also will help them with patterns. You know, I help them understand patterns. It's kind of mathematical too, in a way. <laughs> yeah, it kind of helps people tap into that rhythm, especially when you're doing the the long duration ones, because you're right, yes. you, you have to use that centrifugal force. And then it's almost like if you do high rep kettlebell snatches, Correct. Like you, you have to be super efficient and you have to know exactly when to relax, when to be tight. Almost a little bit more like kettlebell sport. Yeah, you know, it's a little just bit like looser. kettlebell sport. Yep. Yeah, I would say it's a little bit more like that. And a lot of people try to approach it a little more hard style with club swinging, or they'll just whip it around. And I'm like, that doesn't do anything to your joints, especially if you're swinging like three to five pound clubs or anything heavier. <laughs> like, yeah, that's a lot. Of, that's a lot of weight. Yeah, it is a lot of weight. Like, yeah. Right. <laughs> yeah, I think for people that look at Indian clubs, probably talking more to men is. They look at a one pound Indian club and they're like, what is this going to do? So they, and there's that thing in the brain, that macho thing that says, oh, I can do a heavier club, five pounds. And you're like, no, that's going to, that's a serious, serious jump. Yeah. Yeah. Like, Very. Yeah. Because the weight increases as it's as coming you, down, anyways. Yeah. So that one pound increases in weight. And <laughs> if you get them to swing for five minutes continuous, they're going to be like, oh my gosh, <laughs> yeah. that one pound is going to feel like five pounds. <laughs> yeah. Cause I only have two, I have one and two pounders. Yeah. Me too. It. I mean, two yeah. pounds is good. Like it's, yeah. yeah. Cause yeah. I mean, primarily we're using it just to get that flow, get the shoulders moving for people that have shoulder issues Clubs usually have a pretty solid benefit as far as freeing up the scapula, getting the shoulders to move a little bit better. Yes, absolutely. And that's kind of one of the primary ways I suggest incorporating it is you can use it as a a warm up, a priming tool, but you can also use it in between sets. You know, so you're doing a lift, say you're doing, I don't know, deadlifts or pull ups or even bench press or something. In between the set, instead of getting on the phone, just, you know, <laughs> do 10 repetitions of heart swings, inward, outward. It flushes out any kind of stiffness, especially if you're lifting heavy. So it's kind of the fast, loose principle in kettlebells. You can incorporate that same idea if you're creating all that tension in a particular lift. And then you want to hey say, hey, I want to make sure I'm still getting my range of motion in my joints. Because I know this past year the heavier and heavier I've been lifting and creating all that tension, me being super flexible and mobile, I noticed a little bit of a decrease in that. Mm. And so I made sure I'm adding my swinging in between and working on that because 
it just reminds my body, Hey, you still have to work internally, externally in the shoulder, you know, just remembering those different planes of motions and, and those joints and stuff that kind of keeps me, you know, balanced. It's a good point that you brought up where you noticed that stiffness increasing in your connective tissue rather quickly where people kind of don't have that body awareness. Yeah. And it's one of those things, if, if they're not diligent to notice it and then do something about it, they're going to find, okay, why am I not able to move like I used to? Mm -hmm. And it's just a thing that happens with, you know, lifting heavier, or even I would say, if you're going in a hypertrophy phase, like it's so important to balance that out. And club swinging is an easy, you can do it in your session. So it's not like Mm -hmm. taking up time. You just incorporate it all together. Do you have a a specific clientele demographic that you like to work, that you work with? Like, do you work with mostly athletes or do you work with? I work with everybody. I have older clientele, you know, people that I've had for years that (laughs) club swinging is definitely more of a brain challenge for them. So we keep it really, really simple. I have some, like I would say general athletes, you know, whether they have a, well, I have a golfer and he, um, you know, that's his serious hobby. So he wants to be really good at golf. And then, you know, I do workshops, I'll do online coaching. So I kind of have a smattering. I have women kind of in that 30 to 40 age group, which I really enjoy training for a host of reasons. And then I have currently several older clients. So I don't like to say old, but I mean, like 50 50 on up. I still think that's young, but you know, (laughs) but 50 on up kind of clients too. So that's another demographic as well. Some people don't like clubs and I won't push it on them. Oh, okay. Um, So I'm just not going to push it. I'll find other means to kind of create the same effect, but then there's others that really, really love it. And so I'll give them a pair of clubs to take home and I'm just say, Hey, you know, if you're sitting at a desk job or whatever, like pick these up, you know, do them. And I had one guy, he he did that and he kept on talking about, and he had serious, serious mobility issues, but it really, really started helping keeping things just looser. So we wouldn't always go back to ground zero every time. Yeah. I love the wrist work with clubs. That's one of my (laughs) favorite things, just working on the wrist. Cause I think the clubs go a really long way to helping increase, especially nowadays with people's wrists, they're so locked up. So I think clubs are really hugely beneficial for getting wrists to start moving a little bit more. Uh, you're, you hit on something there because just even the fingers to the wrist right here, mm-hmm. if people are using their mouse or whatever. So everyone has different ways of teaching grip and stuff in club work, but there's still a whole lot of benefit. Like I'm doing just little things throughout my patterns, or if I'm doing hip reels, back circles, like you're getting into this position with your mm-hmm. pointer finger, like pushing up on the club. And so think about this, like A lot of people have a hard time even getting here or uh, the wrist circle. (laughs) I had one person I remember on social media, just kind of lambast this woman that I shared who was trying to do wrist circles. Like, oh, that's so easy. It's just a circle. Found out he didn't, he was a beginner. He didn't know anything. I'm like, no, you try to do a wrist circle. Like, we're just not used to doing that yeah, motion yeah. anymore and, and, and with control. And like, it's a lot harder than you think. And so you're right. It's so good for you. Just that, that whole era, we kind of forget about that. Well, it's kind of funny because back when I first saw the wrist circle drills being done, it kind of reminded me of the old beat cops that had the billy clubs and you'd see them walking down the street (laughs) and they were doing, that's what they did. I mean, typically they only did it with one hand. So that one wrist was really mobile and really the dexterity was there. Mobility was there, but that was one of the first things I thought of. I was like, Oh, okay. (laughs) You know, you just, I love the transitions up and down and really the, the hand grip work is really key too. So I, I really enjoy the benefits of that. Yeah. I'm, now I'm going to have that nice visual in my head when I practice. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's a person walking around with the billy club. <laughs> yeah. Cause you see, you know, it's like when you want, uh, they saw that in, uh, well, Sean Connery was doing that. Remember when he was doing in untouchables, when he walks up to Kevin Co- Elliot Ness, he's, he's, fl- he's taking the club and he's just doing the, some wrist rotations with it. To pull that up. Man. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> I don't remember that. It's just all, like walking up. Cause he's, cause that's what they would do just past time. They just, 
walk and yeah. do circles with it. Yeah. Wrist drills. It's so, because uh, Ed Thomas was also big on inversion too. Because remember, he talked about that inverted hanging along with doing the club work when we were there. And then Melody Schoenfeld was doing mace work. Because right. that was our first, well, at least that was my first exposure to mace work. Yeah. And we went to the workshop. Yeah. So, and you do a lot of mace work. Yeah, I do mace as well. Just kind of, I keep with the standard stuff on that, but it's it's the same kind of thing. And what I love about those kinds of tools is it, you can't muscle it. Yeah. <laughs> you, can't you want to it. though. You got to go with the gravitational pull, the inertia, and then lining yourself up correctly that it sinks up. Instead of like, no, I've got muscle and I can do it. Well, you are eventually going to start getting problems in your elbow. You're going to feel, you're going to feel things in the wrong places because when you're doing it right, it just flows. It just flows together. So you ask like Kelly and some of the other people that are huge. I mean, how they make 30, 35 pounds or 25 pounds. One arm swing looks so effort, effort, effortless, you know, (laughs) they're not muscling it. (laughs) So. Yeah, because that was one of the first things that I, when I saw mace work being done was kind of like the athleticism. Mm-hmm. It, it, you're, it's for people that are more that bodybuilder style, they tend to get really robotic in their mm-hmm. movements. Right. Like they lose that athleticism look. Uh, so that was when I, when we saw maces, I was like, oh, that looks, because it brings back, you, it brings you back to having that coordination and that total body flow. And you bring up a point there because, I think sometimes those practices can be intimidating to the general public, but Mm -hmm. Olympic lifting can be intimidating, but people are so used to that, you know, Mm -hmm. but that's a high skill move, same with kettlebells. But when you start practicing high skill art forms, you become better at everything else. Mm -hmm. So the older I've gotten, I feel like I can go into most things now and kick it up like that. And when they always say, hey, well, you know, you that's in your 20s or your teens. That's the best you'll ever be. I'm like, no, no. <laughs> actually the opposite. It's yeah. how you train. And so if because um, I started my training a long time ago, kind of it's just standard bodybuilding lifting stuff. But <clears throat> if I want to go practice handstands now or I want to pick up some other kind of skill related sport or hobby, I can do it with just so much easier. It comes quicker. And you're right. like. So I also, I grew up, you know, ice skating. So I grew up in a stiff boot since I was four. Mm -hmm. And then I got, once I got out of the boot and I started, I went into tennis. What happened? I sprained my ankle like four times. (laughs) So one of the things I have found with also this kind of training injuries can happen, but you are way more reactive because you become even more body aware. So when I go trail run now, I've rolled my ankle. It's like gone laterally, but Things that I've watched you do has also helped me too. Cause like I'm now I, I put pressure on my in ranges of motion, you know, and I start working that or, you know, all that stuff's important. So I've rolled my ankle, but I haven't sprained it, you know, cause I've built up resilience to that. So all that kind of stuff plays into things that we forget about. And it's not the, guess the fun stuff, but ultimately it just makes you a better athlete and well-rounded person. So Yeah, I had the same experience, especially playing hockey. I sprained both my ankles four times. So I had eight ankle sprains in high school by the time I graduated. Dang. Oh, yeah, yeah. My ankles were shot. My family doctor even told me, he's like, you're ev- you're eventually going to break one of your ankles. <laughs> so he's like, it's, and I, he, he's like, it's probably better for you to do that just Stop to get walking. it over with. And I was like, you know, as a kid, you're just all like, okay. You know, so... <laughs> Third, you know, almost 30 years later, and he passed away, but it would be great to show him footage of what I can do now compared to what his mindset was, you know, when he was treating my ankles and saying, okay, well, we'll just immobilize it, use some crutches, blah, blah, blah. But he was like, you'll never have full function of your ankles, blah, blah, blah. And yet I squat on the sides of them. I, you know, so it's kind of like, It's just getting people to think that and be progressively explorative with their movements, Mm -hmm. right? Don't go from zero to 10, start at one and two, but at least try to figure out, okay, 
where can my body adapt and, and what ca- ca- uh, capacity can I start to get into? Yeah, absolutely. And that was one of the takeaways that I it still resonates with me and I use often mm-hmm. is sometimes I remember when we when I did the workshop, getting people to play or yeah. give them a task to do, you know, so it takes them out of that fear mindset or I can't do this. And I've used that often. Uh, with my clients is just get them to do a task or play. And all of a sudden, you know, somebody that couldn't squat properly or whatever, their natural squat position, they got into it. Mm -hmm. And uh, I had one guy who had really, really bad mobility issues. And when I, here's, here's a bell. I want you to pick this up. He got down great squat position so he could do it. It was just having to think of a different way. And so, yeah, that's, that's, a huge thing because sometimes just phrasing certain in in coaching with somebody phrasing things certain ways will actually lock them up more than free them. Yeah. Because there's just that mental, and it really Mm -hmm. just drives home the fact that your mindset really is the first thing you got to work on because is, is mentally, if you're locked up, if you're inhibited mentally, you're going to be physically inhibited. Mm -hmm. Uh, So it's just getting people to do, realize that and when you film them, you give them a simple task, you film them, you go, and you show it to them later, you go, this is what you did. Yeah. You're capable of doing it. All we did was just change your mindset and perspective on that task. Yeah. And it, it's important because I get inspired by watching what you do. And I have a client right now that I, I've taken on. She has arthritis in her toes. She, mm. cannot, she cannot do this. Okay. I mean, that takes out a lot of movement. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And so having to get her to feel comfortable doing things is one thing. So the mindset and then figuring out other ways to strengthen her legs, strengthen things, you know, even test out like, okay, is this that painful? You can't do anything like this will never happen. Or are we going to test it out and see maybe eventually, you know, stuff like that. I'm not in her body, but, you know, no. just feedback and stuff. So sometimes we can get so dogmatic about how we're supposed to move or this is how you're supposed to do things instead of, Hey, I'm dealing with, we're we're dealing with real life people and Mm -hmm. you have to be creative, Mm -hmm. you know? So, well, it's like you said, with going back to the bent press, your bent press is going to look different than my bent press versus Neil's bent press. There's going to be very subtle differences, but it's, it's when we get stuck with that. No, everybody needs to look exactly the same all on the same lines. And it's like, no, body types are different. Health issues or injury history is different. So those play into how we execute certain movements. Yeah, absolutely. I was talking to John Sinclair and going back to ice skating. Ice skating nowadays, especially with hockey players, is that most skating coaches are trying to get all hockey players to look the same, skate the same. Really? Yeah. So back in the day, like in the 1960s, 70s, 80s, You could actually not look at the person's jersey, but you could tell who you knew who it was just based off their stride, the way they skated. Like you knew who it was just based off their movements on the ice without having to look at their jersey. Nowadays, pretty much every so many people look the same out on the ice. Is that just trying to create like a standardized way of? Yeah, this is the only way you should skate. This Mm -hmm. is how we want you to skate. Wow. You know, I think we see the same thing in baseball, you know, when pitching yeah. pitching coaches want to change somebody's mechanics, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. You know, there's Tim Lincecum was a perfect example, right? Yeah. So they wanted to change his pitching, what he does. And we were like, well, he's won Cy Young's doing what he did before. So, you know, it's just, it's getting into that point of let people do what they do. If something pops up, then... <laughs> let's address it but if they're getting by if they're excelling with what how they do it then yeah, maybe we should it. just leave it alone <laughs> absolutely right so you do mace work every day club work every day i do club work a lot more than mace work i will say okay. that one of the things you know juggling all sorts of stuff i even got like poi poi balls now i don't are you familiar with poi no so it's similar to Indian clubs, but they're like balls on the end of a kind of a string thing. And so there's similar movements, but it's like, oh. it's into visual arts. These are LED poi balls. So okay. there's another oh. going down. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's super cool. I think you would, you would dig that. <laughs> P-O-I, poi. P-O-I. All right, yeah. I'll check, check it out. out. Go on YouTube. <laughs> okay. 
All um, right. But I am wanting to add. So usually when I program out, if I'm doing clubs, I usually also add my mace. So that's kind of on my new protocol is to now that I got away from a bunch of barbell work that I was doing. Okay. I'm adding the mace back in because man, after you do like 200 swings of mace, one of the things you, it leaves you a little present. You're super sore in your tries and of course, super sore in your lats. So, and just that, that movement pattern, I mean, it makes you so strong. So I'm planning on adding that, but usually with club work, I'm doing that. If not every session, every other session. So yeah, I'm always adding a little bit in. Now, do you usually, at the end of your workouts, do you usually finish with some active stretching with the sticks? So I usually do, I do a lot of my stretching actually beforehand with the oh, sticks. Oh, okay. Yeah. All right. Yeah. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> partly because it's more preparatory stuff. So mm-hmm. whether I want to open my lateral line, so like the bow and arrow or, you know, ninja or something like that. Um, I do a lot of like rotational stuff with the sticks before I work oh, out. Nice. And then... At the end, I might do some. No, I would say I keep the sticks at the beginning of the workout. And I'll so, do like body weight stuff at the end. So, with your hypermobility, do you try to avoid like long static stretching? No. <laughs> no. Okay. <laughs> I do. I, I do it all. So I don't. I do kind of push my flexibility. And like, I mean, I mean, I do the splits, and I always mm-hmm. want to make sure I can maintain the splits. <clears throat> I no. I. I mean, I. I do a lot of that. So I just make sure. So. I'll do passive stretching and really try to kind of see if I can go a little further. I do, of course, strict mobility work. And then I work on strength flexibility. So if I'm doing the splits, I've done stuff where I'm, you know, put my legs up on benches Mm -hmm. and actually like holding that with my inner thighs, my adductors. So now I'm actually working on strength in my flexible positions. So I do that a lot where I'll do things with the pigeon where it requires strength. I did something the other day. So I was in a lunge position doing deep flexion. And then I actually dropped my leg into pigeon and then Ooh, my oh, leg back up. So nice. my abductors now are really working and can I control that? So I do things like that as well. I always try to work it all 3D. <laughs> yeah. And I think it's just, it's so important to strengthen those end ranges too. Yes. So that's my main thing. I'm not going to not do mobility and, you know, see what I can do and maintain that. I'm just going to make sure that I'm strong down there or wherever I'm, whatever position I'm in. Yeah. yeah Cause it goes back to your whole focus of longevity. Yeah. You want to, you want to be doing the same thing when you're 70, 80 years of age. Exactly. Yeah. And, and having that, I think that's a game changing perspective that I think a lot of people come Eventually, too, it's just hopefully they don't get to that. They don't have that too late in life, so to speak. I think it, it kind of depends on if they're around people that inspire that. True. Your your yeah. culture. Yeah. So I'm around a lot of runners. I join a running group. Like they're one of the hardest to tap into to like get out of that. Oh <laughs> yeah. I don't know. Um, <laughs> And eventually, though, they kind of come around because they see my stuff. Oh, what crazy thing is Monica going to do next? So, you know, I've inspired a little bit to, to branch out and do things. But I'm here in Texas in Fort Worth, which is an interesting place because it's slow for people. Like, I think I'm the only one that's doing Indian clubs here. You know, you just you just don't see you it. You don't see it. You don't see it. Of course, in Austin, you have on it. So you got the steel mace, the mm-hmm. more like the steel mace flow and stuff. You know, it's just me. Thankfully, I'm self-motivated. But like, if I wanted to be inspired to try something new, we just, we don't really have that. You know, y'all are in California, right? So mm-hmm. yep. yeah. um, I'm sure that's probably a little different there. But having a culture where, you know, you can be inspired to try new things or have a different perspective about how you train is massive. And you know, fortunately we can kind of do that as coaches, but general public, you know, it just takes, it takes a while and, or, you know, we have to provide opportunities for people to at least, you know, get that interest sparked. Yeah. I think if we, it would be really interesting to see actual numbers of people who work out on a regular basis. What tools do they use? I just, yeah. Steel maces are probably still pretty low as far as utilization. Cause I think a lot of people just straight intimidated. They look at a steel mace and like, I'm going to hit myself. <laughs> mm-hmm. That's typically what you right? That's what you, yeah. oh, I'm not, I'm going to hit myself. So that right there is one of the first roadblocks of, I think, that why people don't pick one of those up. Yeah, I agree. So it would be interesting to see, because I think most people that do go to work out, there's mm-hmm. t- dumbbells 
machines, cables, and barbells, and yeah. that's about it. And I think kettlebells have, have made their way in there they, now. Yeah, they have bigger traction. Yeah. yeah. I'm seeing a few, some people that like tag me and things on Instagram, they'll work at like a, I think like anytime fitness and there's some still maces there. There's oh, wow. like huge kettlebells. I'm like, wow. Okay. We're coming along now, <laughs> but it's kind of few and far between, but I think obviously social media, mm-hmm. the good and the bad, but that's the good of it. It is, you know, people are seeing it, at least they're getting eyes on it. So that's kind of creating more of awareness out there. So, so that's a, that's a positive. Well, like rhino strength. I told Neil, I'm amazed that the gym that he works out at has those size kettlebells. I mean, I, I've never seen anything at a regular gym more than 50 kilos at at the most. Yeah. I mean, yeah, you don't even see that. You don't even see that. 32 maybe. 32 is, yeah. Yeah. That's about about it. And he's got, he's, I was like, oh, first time I saw that, I was like, I'm jealous that you actually (laughs) have access to that weight, (laughs) you know? I was That's super amazing. impressed. Yeah, I told him, I said, next time I'm in Chicago, we definitely, I got to see the facility works out at just because, <laughs> like I said, I'm amazed that they have that much, that that weight available to them. Maybe the clientele or athletes or something. Yeah, he well, he makes that, he makes those kettlebells look so light when he flings those things around. It's that, not, dude is, that dude is strong. Yes. And, and yeah. the kettlebells, you know, as they get bigger, like just try to maneuver them and adapt them like <laughs> i know <laughs> it feels like your form's gonna snap <laughs> yeah, <exactly. laughs> and he makes that stuff look easy yeah yeah big time yeah. so you're doing some instructing now correct yes like yeah that's awesome so you uh you have a mace wor- uh indian club workshop coming up yes so it started here <laughs> actually before covid kelly and i were talking about doing a mm-hmm. uh, indian club mace workshop and um COVID hit. So uh, one of the gyms that I was talking to reached back out to them last year and put on a workshop for any clubs went really, really great. And so that was one of my things is like, okay, you know, I have online programming for it. I have, which which is great. People are gravitating towards that, but still there's nothing that takes the place of in-person learning. Yeah. 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 One of my friends up in Ohio, he's uh, strong first. He has his own gym. He invited me to do a Indian club workshop up in Cincinnati and then working on when I did my strong first elite in Dallas, one of the instructors there was talking to me. So we're going to be hopefully planning another workshop in Dallas, maybe later this year. So we'll just have to get the the logistics down. So yeah, it's exciting stuff because I think more people see it and they can have that experience and actually just get clubs in their hand. And I do it a little bit different. So we go through, you know, all the fundamentals we do like prep stuff with stick mobility as well. Mm -hmm. So primes, primes and stuff. And then at the end though, I have a little creative period where they take what they learned and then they create their sequence. They get that stimulation with the creative aspect because that's part of who I am and what I think makes it fun. So and that it also ties everything together. So it shows you if you really learn something, because now you're going to have to like think like that on your feet. Yes. Okay. So I learned this, I learned this, you know, it's just simple stuff. It's not like anything crazy. But when I did that at my workshop last year, I mean, it was so cool to see people's unique styles come out as well. It's like, what did they gravitate towards and how they put things together? And um, they had a lot of fun doing that. So, yeah, it's, it's like art. You teach <laughs> basic techniques. And then you see what the person does with those. Absolutely. And, and do they stay, do they stick to just that? Or do they all of a sudden have that creative creativity where they launch something completely new that's been that hasn't been seen before? Sure. And it, it teaches themselves something because they might realize, actually, I'm nervous to branch out or, wow, this comes mm. easy. And they don't mind exploring or making mistakes. And that's the whole part of it. It's like, I'm not asking for perfection here. It's just explore, like, mm. see what comes out. So it's a, just a self-discovery thing too, which is, you know, really for their benefit. And it's just fun to watch. That's fantastic. So as far as social media, how can people get a hold of you or message you or? Yeah. So I um, primarily just promote my stuff through Instagram. So that's at bold fit technique. It's a play off of my last name, Bolt. <laughs> And on there, I have a little link that goes to my website where I have kettlebell programs. I have Indian club programs and stick mobility. And then I just got on Sambal, which is a great platform 
where I did uh, my Indian, my my most updated Indian club uh, program. So it works in modules, which is really fantastic. Oh, so you can kind of okay. check each one off and it's short, condensed um, information. So I really, really like how that works. But my newest program is on there. And then I'll be putting my intermediate and advanced club program there this year. So that's in the works too. So nice. yeah, that's a way to reach me. See what fantastic. I do. Fantastic. And then hopefully some people reach out, want to host you and hopefully, yeah, get you some yeah. more coverage. Let's get some more people using clubs and May spells and That's we right. love it. All yeah. good stuff. <laughs> Let's get those tools used, right? There's a reason why Absolutely. they were made. I mean, especially because clubs and maces go back for centuries. Ever. Yeah. The history is awesome. And um, I've been delving into that a whole lot. So it's just, it, yeah, it's really fascinating. So fantastic. Well, thank you for joining us today. We appreciate it. Thank you for Thanks, taking so. time thank out. You. Yeah. Yeah, you finally get to meet Neil virtually. I know. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe one of these days in person. I know. Who knows? That's right. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so well well hopefully uh, we'll have you on down the road and then I know you'll probably be branching out, developing some new programming. So yeah, we'll bring you back on once you get that stuff going. And uh, to all the listeners out there, until next episode, be good to each other. Thank you for listening to our podcast. Be sure to hit that subscribe button and whatever platform you're on, either Apple, iTunes, or Spotify, please, if you could leave a review, we'd appreciate that. If you have any questions that we can answer for you, be sure to leave those in the comments also. If you're looking for more information on our education, our products, please go to www.stickmobility.com. And also hit that subscribe button to that YouTube channel. And don't forget our live Instagram classes three times a week. If you want to join in, grab your sticks and hit that 45-minute class.